Please welcome back to the stage Axios Chief Technology Correspondent, Ina Freed. Still excited about the reception, which starts at what time, anyone? 4.20. Right. And uh, before that, though, we have some really great speakers. And I am particularly excited to invite up someone who is also from the Bay Area, but has been spending some time in Washington before me, who is R.T. Prabhakar, who is the head of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. R.T., welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Great to see you, Ina. Um, so I actually think it's perfect that we're having this conversation. I think, you know, as someone who understands uh, the way Silicon Valley works, the way that tech works, and the way that government works to some degree, um, I'm, you know, I think at this moment, and we've been talking about how we really are having a moment around AI where everyone gets um, that it's a future. I think what's really interesting about whether it's ChatGPT or Dolly or these things is I think it's very accessible. People see it. And I think they see something that really excites them, and they probably also see something that scares them. And we've been trying to dissect a little bit sort of what are the things that we're right to be excited about? What maybe shouldn't we count on AI to solve? What are the things we're right to be worried about? What are some of the things maybe we don't need to worry about? Because it's always nice to have a few things we don't need to worry about. Um, maybe let's start there. I mean, what are you excited about and what are you worried about? Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. Um, we, we are at a moment, and it, that moment is because artificial intelligence is the most powerful technology of our time. And it's, we're already living in an artificial intelligence world. We, I mean, we're interacting with it already in every search that we do. I mean, it's just omnipresent already. But now what's happening is that the pace is accelerating tremendously, and its capabilities are getting broader and broader and broader. So, it's the classic AI story now that all, uh, surprisingly, there are these things that people thought computers would never be able to do, and now they can do them. And, and the breadth means that it's going to change so many different parts of our lives. It won't just be in, in the places that, you know, we've sort of already gotten used to seeing AI. And so, so to me, this moment is, it's, it's the story of every powerful technology, uh, all of human history filled with powerful technologies and every single time there's a bright side and a dark side. And what this moment is about is that if we are going to seize these opportunities, we have to start by wrestling with the risks. And, and so I think that's exactly the right place to begin. And one of the things that your office did right as you were getting started was this, you know, blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights addressing a bunch of these. We've even seen that from a bunch of the companies, if yep. you ask Google or Microsoft. A lot of them have these, you know, here are AI ethics principles, and, you know, it's all about equality and fairness and ensuring that, you know, we don't produce discriminatory stuff. My sense is that these are all well-intentioned. At the same time, the industry is moving way faster than any company, even if they wanted to, could implement all of this stuff. How do we go from where we are? We have this rapidly developing technology. We have some sense of where the guardrails maybe should live, but none of them are actually in place. There's almost no legislation around the world. Our friends in Europe will probably be the first to put in an AI act. They've certainly proposed uh, to, to have a wide-ranging act. What do we need to do now um, to, to build a system that any of us want to live in? Yeah. Yeah, and I think the place it begins, I think you use the word guardrails, but I want to take it just a level deeper because especially when this technology is moving at this phenomenal pace, it's more important than ever to be clear about our values. And our, you're right, many, everyone who's involved in this is, is, is appropriately concerned. And I think people are trying to be responsible. What the White House put out with the Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights last year focused on the, the, the core things that have to be true as we reach for these opportunities. And it starts with safety, having systems that do what they are supposed to do and protect people. Uh, it continues to making sure that we're not uh, exacerbating bias and distilling all of human bias into AI systems and wielding them inappropriately. It gets to privacy. It gets to all the different dimensions. And, and this is one of the things that I think is hard and confusing is Yes, we have to deal with the fact that AI systems today 
are being used in ways that exacerbate bias, and we have to deal with that. And it's not an option to just do that because we also have to wrestle with the threats of reality distortion as chatbots become ever more realistic and draw people into these psychological voids. Um, so all, all of these things are happening simultaneously. They represent many different aspects of this you know, multi-pronged uh, powerful technology. And that's, you know, that's what now has to get wrestled and turned from values and a clear understanding of principles into actions. And, and that's going to call, I mean, that, that's, that's our job in government. It is definitely the job and the responsibility of the companies that are driving these technologies. And it's a responsibility for all of us as users as well. And I want to get into how we might start to do that and start to translate that into real action. But there was a proposal today that one of the things we need, it's just moving all too fast. You know, let's hit the pause button and stop everything for six months. Is that realistic? And is that a solution to anything? I thought, I thought the letter with so many signatories was a, it was a great, uh, I mean, that is the moment we're in, right? Is, is so many people are expressing really the same set of concerns from different vantage points, different people have different takes on it. But I think it really does reflect the moment that we're in. And uh, you know, to me, this is a continuation, an important continuation and with broader participation of the values that we've laid out and the work that, that we're very engaged in. I must say, I, I'm a huge sports fan, I'm a huge tech fan. In sports, everyone gets uh, some timeouts. In hockey, they get one. In basketball, they get a bunch more. I've never known the tech industry to take a timeout. Is it at all realistic uh, that the industry is going to take a timeout and say, you know what, this is moving really too fast. Let's take a few minutes to just appreciate what we have and, and make sure we're going on the right path before we build anything new? I, I think figuring out how this technology and its myriad applications, the pace at which they progress, is not, that's not going to be a simple thing. But again, that has to be guided by the values that, that, you know, that we've been very clear about and that I think are, are largely broadly shared. And the question is implementation. So I think we're on the same page that we have to translate the values and the principles into action. Um, what I'm not clear on is how we get there. My sense is we're not going to get there via timeout. I'm not clear. Do you think the timeout's realistic or not realistic? I, I think there are a lot of factors for that. and, and the, uh, that. Uh, I don't, know, okay. I don't know how to answer that cleanly because I think it's a very complex thing. Let's back up for a minute. I mean, let's talk about what, what is actually driving this technology. The components that we're talking about, of course, one is massive AI supercompute capability, um, you know, more or less available widely around the world. Uh, the second is massive data, the internet's data, you know, everything human beings have regurgitated out into the internet. It's everything from the Bible to tweets, all these images. Uh, and then it's algorithms that are very widely available. And so I think it's, I think you have to be clear. I mean, I think there's, of course, everyone would like, there's a lot of conversation about let's pull the plug. I'm not sure there is a single plug. And I think that figuring out actually how, what the pace is going to be and what, what the gates uh, are is not, I don't think it's that trivial. I think it's a multi-dimensional exercise. When you look at the landscape, and this is a lot of what you have to do, what do you look at and say, this is the role of government. This is where we can do something. And here's, you know, I want us to come up with a plan to tackle this piece. And what are the parts that you're like, government isn't going to be able to meaningfully do this. You know, we can be a voice, we can convene people, but that's not our space. Let's start with, what are a couple things you think government could do and does it require new legislation? Yeah, so let me tell you, well, the, the first thing that's obvious is we are looking across government at what is currently going on with artificial intelligence. And what you will find, not surprisingly, is many, many different parts, many different public purposes for which AI is being put to use. Think about our military, think about intelligence, think about the way we use data to make policies better and to make sure that they're deployed equitably. So those are places where there, there, there's active work across government. In doing that, we have a tremendous opportunity and a responsibility to do that in a way that, that expresses our values and is true to the things that, you know, that we're all clear have to happen. So uh, the Office of Management and Budget, for example, has guidance on how agencies implement AI systems. And that's how government makes use and of this AI. And this is our internal use. Sure. So that, that's one dimension of it. So and when you look across that, I think you, you, you will see the 
you know, you'll see the variety of different applications and the variety of ways in which this technology is getting wrangled and put into practical use. And in doing that, I think there's a lot to be learned for the broader community. So that's, that's one uh, dimension of it. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's, I think, we're at a point where that's exactly, that's the work that's going on right now. And as we do that, I think we're going to be in a position to be clearer about the other things that can be done first through, through under existing legislation. What are the appropriate next steps? Where will legislation be required? And I want, you know, we're having a lot of conversation about this next generation of AI and what else is going to be required. But I think we should be very clear that we are already living in an AI-empowered online environment. And the president has been extremely clear on calling on Congress to take action where we know we've got real problems and we have really practical solutions that we could make progress on. Privacy is a great example where many proposals have surfaced. We haven't yet gotten a bill across the finish line, but it's a place where the president's been very clear and has called on Congress. And I think there, protecting children in the online environment, making sure we have you know, robust competition. These are places where we already know that there are practical things that can be done, and we, we need to get started on those while we think about the additional things that have to come as well. And if you, you know, I'm going to give you the Axios magic wand. It's our AI product that we've been developing. Oh, delightful. You get to wave it and have, you know, one piece of legislation that doesn't exist, not just enforcing existing laws with the technology. What's one piece of legislation to address the new reality of AI um, that you would like to see uh, manifest into reality? And then you have to give back the wand for whoever's on stage. That's too bad. I like this wand. Um, I want a, a, a piece of legislation with many, many, many sections because there's just not going to be a silver bullet answer. What, to what are a couple? What are well, a couple I mean, of the, sections? The thing you, I mean, the, the, uh, just to be really serious about this, let's just think about. First of all, what's happening with the current generation, this new generation of AI? What's visible, of course, to over 100 million people who have tried ChatGPT, for example, is one piece of it. These are large language models. They're, they're trained on human language and images. And so the obvious thing is chatbots and image generation and deep fakes and, and videos that you can manipulate in, in ways that are hard to detect. So that's all about the language that humans speak. It's the words that we use. It's the images and the videos that we communicate with. But the power of these new systems is that that ability to wrangle language doesn't apply just to human language. It also applies to the language that computers speak. And if we've already seen how it's changing the business of programming. I have a daughter who's a coder for a living. She already uses Copilot. She's really excited about trying Copilot X. It's going to go much farther and faster. So faster, better software. And it's always bright and dark. So that also means faster, better cyber attacks. And then think about another, a very different dimension of language, which is the language of biology. It's the language of life. And that is what's going to allow us, you know, we're going to have uh, farmers in the Midwest who are going to be able to grow crops that can thrive as the climate changes because of our ability to harness biology. We're going to solve seemingly impossible problems in human health because of what AI brings to biology. And the dark side is either through bio error or bioterror, we're going to face biological threats that we do not want to see happen in this world. So, so when you start thinking about all the different ways that this, this powerful wave of technology is going to affect our lives, there's, I, I think it's, there, there isn't a silver bullet. They're going to, we're going to really have to deal with these different dimensions in different ways. I'm going to let you use the wand one more time before oh, we have to go. You know, there's some school of thought that AI shouldn't be a black box. It should be explainable. You should be able to see why it made the decision it made. A couple of years ago, we were having the discussion, should AI be explainable or not? Suddenly, these large language models are here. They're not explainable. They don't no, tell you why they make things. Should AI be explainable? If you had the magic wand, would okay. you wave it and make it explainable? So, you know, should is such an insidious verb. Because uh, the whole point of this machine learning generation of AI, which is, you know, really has come into the fore over this last decade, is it has always been a black box. It, it, it is, it, you know, it's a neural network uh, in which the weights are adjusted as training happens. And, and inherently, it is, not a, it is not a logical model in any way, shape, or form of anything. It's a bunch of weights. That's, that's a good prediction machine for what should the next word in a sequence be or what should the next pixel in an image be. 
Uh, when I was DARPA director a few years ago, we started a program that was called Explainable AI, and it was specifically trying to build that explainability into it. And I think, you know, now in the fullness of time, I will tell you, I think, I think we may be at a juncture where the closest we're going to get to an explanation of what an AI produce, a, a machine learning generation AI model produces is going to be an assessment by another AI. So I, I think that explainability is something to hope for. I, it's not inherent in the technology. And, uh, and, and I think it does get to the questions of how will we know to be able to trust these systems, which is a central question in any application. Well, I'd love to keep talking. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I'm going to have to take back the wand. OK, um, if, if I could wave it, I'd give us another few minutes, but they've told me I can't. Um, but I'd love to continue the conversation. Maybe next year you'll come back. I'll let you use the wand again. It's a deal. RT, <laughs> thank Parker, you. Head of the White House Office of Science and Technology. Thanks so much.